Buenas tardes. Hablar de tecnologías y no usar tecnologías me parecía raro. Good afternoon, uh, rector, director of the center of the institute, representatives of the global classroom network, secretary general, professors, representative of the, the European Union, distinguished students, professors, lecturers, experts. It's indeed a great pleasure to, to be today with you and in this beautiful place, and I think emblematic place, to discuss uh, the role of new technologies in human rights. Uh, I have to say that it was an e not an easy task. I, I struggle to see which approach I will give, uh, but finally I thought that the, the technologies of, uh, and I see that I have uh, there the Spanish version, but that's fine, I'm speaking English, you get the, the Spanish version. The role of the, the technologies of information and communication uh, due to their transformative power, in my view, are probably a group of technologies that have a tremendous effect on democracy, on development, and human rights. And I also like the fact that in Spanish, we can say Agenda 3D. Uh, it doesn't work in, uh, in English because rights is it's, it's R, but, uh, but fits quite well with, uh, with the Spanish version. Uh, and I decided to start, and since you are in Latin America, although you are coming from several parts of the world, I thought that would be interesting also to address, if possible, some of the issues that this region faces when we, we look at the agenda post-2015. 20, uh, and the first one is that, unfortunately, we are in the region that is the most unequal. It's very hard to accept that, because when you live here, I'm not from here, I'm from Africa, but when you live here, you think, why? It's a rich enough region, both in terms of uh, money-making, production, but most importantly, very, very rich culturally. And if we agree that culture, it's really the basis, not only of, of the rights agenda, but also of the development agenda, then this region has no reason to be so unequal. But it is, and is getting even more unequal. Quality education for all, and uh, during a lifetime, it's still a big issue. The level of technology and innovation in the productive sector in this region is a huge challenge that is, that is faced by most countries here. Many of you spoke about sustainable environmental management, climate change, extreme events. This is one of the most vulnerable regions to climate change. And in different forms, from the lack of clean water if our glaciers are continue to disappear, to really weather-related disasters. I think it was you, the representative of the Euro European Union, that spoke, uh, or, or not, I think it was my colleague from, uh, from from human rights, that spoke of the importance of children and youth. In this region, poverty is a, shield, a child's face. And extreme violence is a youth's face. And so these two groups are very important if we want to speak about rights. And therefore, what we are looking for is the construction of social, uh, knowledge societies in making sure that citizens have the right information to act. Uh, some of you mentioned the movement of students to request for action on climate. Small children, they have access to information. But there are many parts in the world that that access is denied. Freedom of expression, the safety of journalists, just last Friday, we celebrate worldwide the World Freedom Day for, for the, the, the journalists, for the press. Last year alone, 
the Director General of UNESCO had to condemn the death of 99 journalists around the world. So these are issues that if we want to put them together in, in an inter, uh, interrelational way, we have really the agenda, the 23rd agenda, and the 70 objectives that are part of that. But what is interesting about this agenda is that it's not just an agenda. The first one is that it's for everybody. It's a universal agenda. And it's indivisible. And it's integrated. You can't just choose one goal and say, I have reached the promise of this agenda. It's an agenda that brings three important dimensions together. Economic growth, social development, and environmental sustainability. And that, in the core, has to deal with governance issues. Furthermore, and maybe the most important one, is an agenda about rights. Right to education, right to health, right to a clean environment, right not to be angry, right not to accept that there are still poor people in this planet is an agenda of rights. And, and I think is this, and this is a collective pro, uh, process. It's not a process that universities in the global classroom network says, no, no, that's government. No, 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 it's very much yours, as it is government, as it is private sector, as is the single citizen that have responsibilities towards the common good. And because of that, this agenda, more than the previous agenda, it's a transformative, a transformational agenda. But in fact, what we are looking for with this agenda is to create and, and move faster towards a knowledge society. This concept of knowledge society was a big fight for UNESCO. During the, the World uh, uh, Summit on Information Technology, the motto of that summit was information society, knowledge economy. And UNESCO said, no, that's bad. That's very bad. You are going to put a lot of people out. Because information is not enough for action. What we need is knowledge societies. And we say knowledge societies in plural. There is not one knowledge society. But they are societies that are able to identify, to treat, to transform, to use, to appropriate information, to create and apply knowledge for the woman, for the common good. So it's that capacity, not the information by itself. It's the capacity to use, to produce, to produce knowledge with that information. And that is a vision of society, of autonomy, not dependent of others' ideas or constraints, but autonomy of thinking that have these notions of pluralism, integration, solidarity, and participation in the core on the values of that society. This is a very old document of UNESCO, but I'm telling you, it's still very much uh, important today. And that brings us to this idea, then how these technologies that indeed can help us to get information to share, to disseminate, to use that information to produce knowledge. But what are some of many others that are needed if we want to use these technologies for development? The first one is the educational system and the environment of learning. If you don't have that, a good education system, in my country, in Mozambique, we say, it's better no education than bad education. 
because bad education takes you everything, helps you. So it's not just education, it's quality education for all. And this an education that allows us to learn, relearn, unlearn, to learn, no, a completely different transformational system of education. Also, the fact that we have to cherish, and I think is what Global Classroom Network is doing, to share talents at national and regional level that are really able to use knowledge and technology in a way that they can address common goods and, and common challenges. Policies that support that way of doing differently. And more than anything, good governance systems. And that's why we believe that if we have those conditions, if we move towards a knowledge society, then indeed these technologies can help to accelerate human progress. They can help to overcome the digital divide. And indeed, they are a huge instrument to the build of knowledge societies ar around the world. And that's why for UNESCO, it's always important to, to look how can we make sure that we have enough knowledge about these technologies that they can be uh, a, a source of, uh, of, uh, of uh, acceleration for development. And, and clearly, the fact that they are essential, they are. But most importantly, in order for them to be important and to contribute to, to sustainable development, they have to be able, or we have to use them in a way that we integrate the three pillars of sustainable development. We cannot use these technologies only for economical growth, or only for social inclusion, or only for environmental issues. We have to make sure that as we design policies, apps, uh, websites, uh, programs, we need to make sure that we don't fragment the 23rd agenda, the three pillars. They have to talk to each other, they have to, to be in a dynamic uh, conversation. Furthermore, I think it's also very important to use these technologies to monitor and to measure. We can measure how many people are looking at this uh, environment if you are on the web stream. We even know where they are from, or at least where they connect to. It's a type of technology that can support member states to monitor the impact of their public policies. But basically, one of the powerful, as we heard in the beginning today, is that they have the power to include. That's one of the transformative power of these technologies that are so, so important in the overall discussion. Are the new technologies good or bad for us? <laughs> are the good technologies capable of helping us to accelerate uh, development? Yes, they are, principally because of that, if well used. And that's why UNESCO try to identify at least key uh, areas that we need to address. One is freedom of expression is a key element for the impact of these technologies in development and in inclusion. If different countries, different tribes, different ethnies cannot use these technologies to communicate, to put their ideas, to defend their values, to ask for public information, then we will never achieve the agenda because we are not including people. And that's why the access to, to information and public information in particular is so important. It is not a straightforward thing. Just talk about language. I mean, how many language groups do you have in Argentina? And here is probably not that many. Let's go to Mexico and ask how many 
Let's go to many countries in Africa, including mine. Portuguese is our language, but we have 27 languages in the country. No? So this is one of the aspects. The right to privacy. It's fundamental when we are discussing knowledge societies, but that's a big issue, not solved yet. The ethical component of this debate needs to be in the center of the discussion and needs to be in the center of public policies, if indeed these technologies have uh, a, a positive impact in development. And also the potential for open science. We have to use that. This region, is Europe, is much more advanced in their frames or works of, of open science. Africa is now discussing and defining their framework for open science. In Latin America, we have just started the debate last year in Panama during, during the Open Science Forum, science uh, that we had in October last year, and we are keep going, but we need open science in order to use the potential of these technologies for inclusion. But most of the time, public policies are worried about infrastructure. And the funding is for infrastructure, and that's okay. You need infrastructure to access and to have cheap access to these technologies. But it's not enough. You need to go beyond that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You need to go, first of all, to human capital. We need to have the people in this ecosystem capable of using well these technologies. We need content, relevant content, accessible content. And accessibility means language, means for blind people, means for people with discapacities that cannot use the computer as we use. It means a lot of things. It means relevant content for us as we, women, women, for us as young people, for us as workers going into a different uh, type of production. So content is fundamental, and many times that's where we don't have the money. And probably this is one of the aspects that a network such as yours is such an important. How to produce good content so that these technologies can indeed help development. And of course, we also talked about that, but the big challenge is is that we always have to see it as opportunities and risks. Because there are opportunities, huge ones, but there are risks. There are risks. And risks, they only can be managed if ethical questions are part of the debate. Without that, we can't do it. The risks will overcome us. And that's why, and allow me now to go more to what we do in UNESCO. You are probably wondering why, why, why UNESCO, no? The first one, we don't do infrastructure. It's not our metier. But we do content, we do training, we do measurements. And the first one, let me start with what we do for capacity building. And how do we use this technologies in itself to prepare the human capital that we need in order to use the best. One of the, the, the very new ones is this one. We felt that it was very important to develop capacity of governments, of academics, of civil society organization, how to use ICTs to achieve this very ambitious 23rd agenda and the 17 goals. This online course on the first run had over 3,000 uh, participants all over the world. Just to see how thirsty people are for this. 
Another one that we do is how to train judges, inspectors on access to public information, rule of law related to freedom of expression. And in three years, this is very much a Latin American, the Caribbean focus course. We had trained more than 10,000 people in the judiciary system, including from outside the region, just to see how important these topics are for judges and inspectors in the system. And luckily now, we are working with the 12 judiciary schools in the region so that the future judges are already be trained in these issues. And this is very important in a, in a time of internet. There are cases now that involve that. And many of our judges, they never study the implications of internet in the criminal law environment. No? So these are some, this is this type of human resources and human capital that we need to be attentive to train. Another one is social transformation and the question of inequality. We have run now two uh, courses. We are opening the 2019 now. We had in two years, one course a year, 7,000 plus persons participating from governments, from civil society, from universities. No? Why? Because they need to understand inequalities in the region in order to address these issues. So these technologies can be way, way important to massively create critical mass. But the content has to be important. We also do programs, apps, games. We use the technology as they can. The first one, through our studies, we discovered that technology is rarely used by governments to solve social issues, rarely. So we decided to go ahead and say, instead of using this technology just to persecute persons and see if you stole or not stole something. Let's use these technologies to address extreme violence. And let's give to use and this use of this generation that are natives with these technologies. How can you use them to reduce inequalities, extreme violence against young people? We worked on the, uh, the North Triangle, the three countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and uh, El Salvador, that are key areas where extreme violence of youth is a huge issue against youth and perpetuated by youth. So how can we change that using the potential of this technology? Another program that we, we use a lot, principally the young people that are involved, use a lot of these uh, this technologies, it's called Comprometidos. Uh, we are running now the, the, the fifth year of Comprometidos. We just launched last week the regional uh, program in Montevideo. Uh, and basically, it's how to mobilize young people in the region to come up with solutions to problems that they feel their communities or themselves, they suffer, and problems that through technology, the solutions can then be massified and deployed elsewhere. No? And right now, Comprometidos has involved, in effect, uh, it's up now, more than 2,000 proposals have been presented and is growing. Right now, we even have national Comprometidos. We have in Ecuador and we have in Uruguay also national level. We started regional, but the countries are seeing such a big potential that they're saying, please help us to do also this mobilization of youth, creativity, and technology in order to solve issues that we are facing in a, in a day to day. Uh, someone spoke about fake news. Yes, a big problem, a huge problem, principally during electoral years, as we have seen in this region. 
just uh, 10 days ago, the, the, the different uh, pre-candidates uh, in Uruguay from the different parties, they sign a pact that they will not use fake news during campaign. An initiative from the Association of, uh, of Journalists in Uruguay with support from UNESCO and UNDP. This app we developed for the Youth Congress in Panama. There were too many young people together and the organizers were afraid that fake news could create a lot of problems during this huge Congress. So we developed this, this app. And the nice part about this app is not that you just learn how to identify a fake news. More important than that, once you identify that, yeah, this is fake, the responsibility to develop truth and publish that. Because you don't fight fake news just by, just by saying, oh, this is fake news and I do nothing. The only way to really fight fake news is come up with the truth. So young people through the app, they could investigate and decide if it was fake or not, the news they were receiving, and if they were fake, they could produce a counterpoint with the truth and that, in that way fighting fake news. Uh, Edgar Morin, huge thinker, French thinker, a wonderful uh, friend and partner of UNESCO, published a, a report and he talked about seven knowledge that were fundamental for the 21st century. So we have been working with, with Edgar Moran and a group of, uh, of specialists on, on, on complexity, trying to develop games that from children to young people to older people, we can understand what are these issues that Edgar Moran brought in his report and how to learn uh, to deal with that. We also do quite a lot of monitoring and UNESCO Global uh, reports. But I think in this issue of ICTs, we also developed indicators. Because again, if you can't measure how the public policies are having impact, you have a very hard time to know if you are using the full potential of these technologies. So indicators are fundamental. And the one that I want to, to really spend a little bit more time here is the university, universality of internet indicators. UNESCO defends that internet to be really positive for growth and for de sustainable development, it has to be right-based. <laughs> the rights of people have to be respected. It has to be open. It has to be accessible, and this not just by infrastructure, but also by the content, by the languages of the content. And more than anything, it cannot be decided that content just by one group of persons. But we need to have this idea of the multi-stakeholder governance of internet, a huge issue, not solved yet. Started in, in Geneva in 2003, we are in 2019, and this is still a huge issue. So we have now, eight countries, two from the region, that have accepted to use these indicators and to benchmark themselves with international standards and say, are we really open? Is our internet really open in the country? No, the governance of the internet in the country, of the domain of the country, is it a multi-stakeholder coalition or is it just in the, the hands of the government, of a public, of a private institution? Uh, or no profit organization, no? So we are expanding this as, so that countries can have benchmarkings. They can benchmark themselves against <coughs> international standards. Finally, uh, the, last, uh, the last group of, uh, of work that we do is to do with open forums and dialogues. And, and I want to, to, to call attention to this one uh, the third Open Science Forum for Latin America and the Caribbean because it will be in Buenos Aires. So I'm challenging uh, the university 
uh, here in the, 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 the branch of Golwa campus uh, so that you could participate in these movements. Universities is a huge partner of this, of this forum. In effect, we have a forum of rectors during CELAC. This will be the third one. We had 2016 uh, was in Montevideo, last year in Panama, next year in Buenos Aires. And the motto of CELAC 2020 is science includes. So very central to the human rights agenda. Finally, the question of artificial intelligence. UNESCO is working on that and the implications, the social and ethical implications of, of uh, artificial intelligence. And what we are def defending is that these technologies, you cannot just be consumers. You have to produce. Forget about this idea that no, no, it's too complex. I import, no, 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 learn. Learn how to produce, open it up, try to put it back together, learn, learn. Because if you, you don't have the capacity and you don't know how these technologies are built and developed, you are going to be in the wrong end. It's very hard to understand the transformative power for good and bad of a technology if you don't understand the technology itself. So part of the challenge we have in this region and in many regions of the world is that we need to give education, and I think you spoke about that, how to program, how to build uh, robotics, how to develop robotics, uh, how to develop uh, artificial intelligence products in the country, in the region. Don't be in the wrong hands. So a lot of the studies we are doing in policy briefings and a lot of the global forums and regional forums that UNESCO is carrying is precisely how can we make sure that countries can really be involved in the production and development of these technologies, but very much with an ethical perspective to it. What does it bring to our office, a regional office uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean? Three major issues. One is the right to science and to knowledge. A right that is in the Universal Declaration, but for many years have been forgotten. And finally, it's back, and it's back strongly. And in this region, is very much back. When our heads of state last year talked about this, this right as one of the key for the development of this region, I think we have to work on that. And we need universities to be involved in order to ensure this right. Strengthening democratic governance and justice, another area that from the different programs we need more than ever to address. And finally, this idea that uh, you need resilience, but that resilience is to be this combination between the social development and the environmental uh, context you are operating with. So resilience has to have in it built the social issues, the cultural issues, so that indeed we can have a chance in this very changing world. And we do that with networks. And that's why I'm so glad and so honored to be here, because you are a huge network of knowledge production in the area where we work. So really, without our networks, we can't address these complex issues. So thank you very much, and really a pleasure and an honor to be with you.